everybody. I am Levi Lithway from Central European University, and I have a very, 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 very special guest here today. This is Hans-Peter Krizi from the European University Institute, who's joining us to talk about his work, Revisiting the Populist Challenge, uh, which was published in the Czech Journal of Political Science in 2018. So Hans-Peter, say hi, and thank you very much for joining. Hi, hi, Levi, it, it's a pleasure. So, so okay, so so okay. Tell me, I know the story, but tell me, how does one end up in the Czech Journal of Political Science? I didn't even know they have it in English or they publish in English. So there was this conference on populism in Prague. I think it was the third or the fourth. They had a series, of, uh, consecutive years of conferences on populism. And uh, they invited me, I presented this paper there. And uh, then I thought uh, I would like to publish this paper. And I tried perspectives on politics because I thought it's a sort of summary uh, uh, of the state of the art and perspectives on politics is about what uh, is adequate for this kind of papers, but they rejected it. And they rejected it uh, saying that there was nothing new in this paper. So after that experience, I turned to the Czechs who really wanted this paper. And they asked me, why don't you give it up to us? Uh, we have a special issue on populism based on this conference. And that's why I ended up in the Czech uh, review for political science. I think the fact that you use it proves that it was not a bad decision. I mean, not oh, many no. people not many people know about it, but I'm very happy that you can use it, find it useful. Well, we'll try to drum up some publicity for this. I, I, I mean, I loved it. I didn't know about it either until you mentioned it in one of our conversations that you've done this. And uh, I, of course, immediately went and grabbed it and I read it and I guess it's such a wonderful overview. So, uh, so, uh, so yeah, thank you very much for pointing me to it. And let's hope that now we can point more people to this, to this article. So, all right. So, so, so you start with saying populism is an ideology. So how, how does this contrast with kind of other views and other, other, uh, other definitions of populism? I mean, there are different definitions of populism, and but uh, populism as an ideology, the so-called ideational definition is the one that is imposing itself in academia, I guess. <laughs> and uh, there are others. Uh, there is the one on coming mainly from the Latin American scholars who define populism as a strategy, as a political strategy. There is the definition by Nadia Urbinati, who defines populism as a political project of renewal. And there is all these communication people who define populism as a communication strategy, as a discourse. Mm -hmm. uh, but I personally think that uh, the ideational definition is to is the one we all are going to end up with, probably. I I, I have to agree. I'm, I'm very much in favor of uh, that approach. I, I, because of its utility, mainly. I think it has more utility and it's 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 uh, more uh, uh, cohesive and concise uh, and uh, comprehensive in a way. So, but but okay, but ideology. So when I talk to Kirk Hawkins about this, for example, he he always says that, well, okay, it is a thin-centered ideology or a discursive frame. Uh, it doesn't matter how you, how you view it. It's the same thing. How, how do you feel about that? Yeah, the same thing, thin-centered ideology or what would be the alternative? Like this, like a discursive frame, like a, like this. Yeah, I, 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 the way I think about it is that the discourse side of it is the way to operationalize the thin, thin centered ideology. You analyze, you end up analyzing the discourse, or you end up analyzing, doing content analysis on texts, and and you by analyzing the discourse, you operationalize people-centrism, anti-elitism, and popular sovereignty. And mm -hmm. you try to do that uh, 
by analyzing text. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, some people would bring in the Manichaean worldview as, as, as being a component here. What, what, how do you feel about that? I, I think the people centrism and anti-elitism, they include the Manichaean view because the people are good and the elites are bad. And, and this is this black and white kind of view, which is implied by the first two components. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So, so, uh, so in this article, you, uh, you talk about this vision for democracy, the vision of democracy that, that populism has, uh, which would be an illiberal democracy. And there's some debate about if, if this is even a democracy or not. Uh, uh, is it misleading to call it a democracy? What, what do you think? No, I think that the basic model of democracy is the liberal democratic model. And this liberal mm -hmm. democratic model has two components, the liberal component and the democratic component. And it is, of course, true. I mean, Jan Werner Müller, he's right. You cannot have liberal democracy without the liberal component. You need civil rights, you need the freedom of speech, you need freedom of assembly, freedom to organize, you need checks and balances, you need pluralism, ideally. But uh, I think the combination of the two components is variable. You can have more or less of one, of the one or the other. And You can put the accent more on the democratic component or more on the liberal component. I give you an example. Okay. Uh, last Sunday, two days ago, the Swiss voted on the burka ban. The book, that's this wheel in front mm -hmm. of, of uh, an entire wheel. So the disguise of the face was to be banned. And a, a majority of 52% of the Swiss voted in favor of this initiative. So from now on, the Buka is banned in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Now you could say this is a highly illiberal measure. It, it violates freedom of uh, religion and it is uh, abolishing a civil right to a certain mm -hmm. extent. Now, I would agree with this. And uh, I, I would think that direct democracy is a relatively illiberal form of democracy because in the end, the majority rules. The, the, the yeah. majority who votes yes has no regard for the minority that is overruled. And in this particular case, it was 48% of the, the Swiss who were overruled by 52%. So you can have a more or less illiberal form of democracy. And I, I think direct democracy is relatively illiberal. And the populist democracy is highly illiberal. It gives short shrift to pluralism, short shrift to check and balances, short shrift to de deliberation, and short shrift to intermediation by parties. It, it links the people directly to the to the leader and all of this is rather illiberal. But I, I still think the majoritarian component is a element of the democratic component and populist democracy just puts the accent on the democratic component to the expense, at the expense of the liberal one. Yeah. Cer certainly. So, so you mentioned Frieden and his uh, thin and thick uh, ideologies uh, in in the in the first part of this article. So, uh, so people have called populism a thin centered ideology, uh, and of course, other thin centered ideologies is nationalism, feminism, environmentalism. So these these have been often cited as uh, as thin ideologies. Uh, and then Frieden came out in 2017 and said, no, <laughs> so he doesn't think that populism is a thin-centered ideology, which uh, was embarrassing after calling it uh, for a decade. Yeah, but, so. but I mean, he, he said it's not even a thin-centered ideology. It's so truncated, so emaciatedly thin, he wrote, <laughs> that it is a 
too impoverished to be called an ideology. But I think in an ideological void, even a very, very thin centered ideology or something uh, as impoverished as uh, populism can still serve as a map in unknown territory. Admittedly, a poor map and a poor man's map and the map for political ignorance, but it is still uh, providing some sort of guidance, especially if it is combined with a host ideology as it usually is. Yes. So I, you know, that Laclau, he talks about uh, the formal logic of populism and uh, this formal logic pits uh, people against the power block. And both terms, he says, are empty signifiers. You can fill the people with significance and you can fill the power block with significance, provided you have a host ideology. But this is just, I mean, this language is a, a, a sort of fancy language that is likely to be misunderstood by most people, but it's the same thing. He's actually saying that these empty fit signifiers, it's, it's a very thin kind of ideology, which can be filled with other things. And it is usually filled with other things. Yeah, you, you mentioned the term host ideology is what would fill these. Uh, let's just clarify what that means. Uh, that means left and right mainly, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, that means that on the right, it's mainly nationalism. And on the left, it's uh, some sort of class ideology. Yes, yes, indeed. All right. So, so next section of this review is what gives rise to populism and you highlight two of uh, two things over here and one is the the crisis of political representation and the other is the role of the media so let's start with the crisis of representation you you divide this into functionalist and structuralist interpretations can you can you say a few words about this yeah the functionalist interpretation is is the one by peter mayer yes uh, uh, and he claims that parties are less and less able to mobilize people. Mainstream parties are more and more becoming indistinguishable and more and more remote from the ordinary voters because mainstream parties are governing parties and as governing parties, they have to take responsibility with respect to a large number of stakeholders. So they can no longer be responsive to the people to the same extent that uh, some uh, opposition party might uh, be responsive. So he, this functional interpretation says, parties are less and less relevant. Mm -hmm. a, a populist democracy is a party-less democracy. Parties lose their function as intermediaries between the people and, and, and uh, the elite. Now, the, the structuralist interpretation, which I adhere to, uh, mm -hmm. says that the lack, I, I mean, agrees with Peter Mayer, that there is to, to some extent a lack of responsiveness of mainstream parties with respect to the voters. For example, uh, in terms of immigration, the mainstream parties have just neglected the concerns of large parts of the population with respect to immigration. This neglect provides opportunities for new challenges. Uh, and these new challenges might mobilize voters in terms of the neglected themes, uh, the themes that the uh, mainstream parties have neglected. First came the Greens, then came the radical uh, right parties and also uh, the radical left parties. And what, what you get, you get a realignment in the party system structured by the new challengers. So I think populism has to be interpreted as part of this realignment uh, uh, in the party system. Challenger parties are populist parties, but challenger parties are institutionalizing and they are becoming mainstream parties in the long run. So. If you have this structural kind of interpretation, you would think that 
the radical populist right is not uh, a temporary phenomenon, but its populist characteristics might be temporary as it institutionalizes mm -hmm. and becomes a stable element of the transformed, realigned party system, it becomes like other parties. And I think you can observe this because these the radical right populist parties are mainstreaming. They become similar to other parties, not uh, very quickly, but uh, in the long run, it is probably happening. I see, I see. And what about the media? Yeah, I, I wrote a bit about the media in this paper, but let's just say the media have a facilitating role. Mm -hmm. uh, the the so-called political communication scholars talk about the media logic, the media logic which uh, personalizes politics, which dramatizes politics. And this is something which uh, is uh, favors populists because populists have charismatic leaders. They, they personalize politics like the media do, and that's why they are attractive for the media. They dramatize, they provoke, they exaggerate. And, and this is what the media likes. So the media like to report on them. And this is a facilitating condition for their rise. But I would say that's about it. Mm -hmm. Like you, you could say, I mean, also, rhetorically, these uh, populist leaders, they speak, uh, uh, Mancini, uh, a communication scholar from Italy, he says they speak the language of the bar, the language yeah. of the common man. How, I mean, Trump talks very crudely. Everybody uh, is not, not necessarily used to the kind of language populist uh, leaders use. But this is the language of the common man. It's the rhetoric that uh, is used in the bar and that it is attractive for a large part of the constituency of these leaders. So the rhetoric is also specifically populist. That's the communication strategy side to it. Mm -hmm. I actually had a conversation with Kirk Hawkins about this. And, and he said that in the end, all of these conceptions of populism kind of feed back to the ideational approach. I mean, speaking the language of the bar, as you called it, is nothing else but people centrism. It's another expression of people centrism. Yes, yes. That's why the, I said before, uh, the, the discourse or the rhetoric is a sort of operationalization of the yes. ideational concepts. Yeah, no, I, and, and I fully agree, and I fully agree with you. Yeah. Um, so, yes. Um, all right. So, you know, next you hit uh, on the consequences, which I mean, this is where the least research is. But uh, but I think the starting point you 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 start from here is populism is both a democratic corrective and a threat to democracy, potentially at the same time. Uh, can we unpack that a little bit? Because I think that is really at the core of how we should be looking at the consequences of populism. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, a lot of people think populism is a great threat to democracy. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, just as a reminder, I, I in the paper, I say it can also be a corrective. And, and I take the idea from Rovira Kaltwasser, and I think Müde, they, they wrote about this. And populists themselves, they think they are the greatest Democrats in the world because yeah. they, they are bringing democracy back to the people and they uh, reveal that the elites have betrayed the people. So they, they believe, as uh, Margaret Canovan said, in the redeeming characteristics of democracy. Uh, and to some extent, they are not entirely wrong. For example, turnover increases, participation in election increases. Some people who have uh, been alienated from politics come back and participate again. Of course, having said this, populism is also a threat. I don't deny that it can be a threat, but what I think is very important and what I point to is that they are a threat under certain conditions when they come to power. 
and they are especially a threat if they get power undivided. So uh, I turn to a discussion of the conditions under which the threat can be contained. And I say there are, uh, there are some constraints. And I don't know whether you want me to go into these constraints. I could uh, mention. I mean, sure, why not? <laughs> I mean, first there are the institutional constraints. Mm -hmm. and, and first you have parliamentary systems and presidential systems. Presidential systems concentrate power in the hands of, of presidents. Some parliamentary systems do that too, like the UK, if you have majoritarian electoral system. So I, I say the electoral system is a really a very important uh, constraint for populists. And if popul so if you have proportional systems, you can divide power. And in proportional systems, usually governments have to be coalition governments. So parties have to join coalitions and that imposes a very strong constraint on populists. Uh, they have to make compromises with the other incumbents and they cannot impose themselves unilaterally. Now, if they impose themselves unilaterally, Typically, they change the electoral system as they have done in Hungary. Uh, they, <laughs> they try to cement their majority by introducing majoritarian elements in the electoral system. The, the second constraint is the partisan constraint. Uh, Zibla, uh, Levitsky and Zibla, they, they write uh, about the death of democracy and they say the parties are the arbiters of democracy. And they make this uh, famous distinction uh, they take from uh, uh, Linz, Juan Linz, between loyalists, semi-loyalists and uh, disloyalists. There are semi-loyalist parties or semi-loyalist people in parties and they are particularly dangerous for democracy. These are the people uh, like the Republicans in the United States who condone uh, the, the populist leader, who, who look away, who justify, and who even support uh, uh, these leaders, just uh, because these leaders are important for the survival or the success of the party. And these are the people who have, uh, in, in the Weimar Republic, have played a very uh, significantly uh, disastrous role. And these are also the people you find, for example, uh, up to very, very recently in the European People's Party. They condone uh, everything uh, Orban does. They look away, they close their eyes, they justify, and they think it's not so bad and so forth. But now they have, uh, they, they have uh, drawn some uh, consequences and they have separated uh, Orban and the EPP, but this is a, 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 a constraint, I think, which is important if uh, partisans are really loyal to democracy. I, I, I would probably put the US example with Donald Trump here as well. I mean, the, the party had every opportunity to stop him but they didn't. <laughs> yeah, you are absolutely right. I said that yeah. I, I gave the Republicans as an example. They, they are yeah. actually the classic example mentioned by Levitsky and, and Zibla. There are other constraints. Uh, there are international constraints. I mean, mm -hmm. when the Central and Eastern European countries wanted to join the European Union, they had to uh, take over the Aki Communautaire, uh, except that this was a, a one-off event. And once they were members, uh, the constraints apparently were no longer so tight as expected. But international constraints can also be economic. And for example, you had the Salvini, when he came to power together with Cinque Stelle, he was very Eurosceptic uh, with the consequence that lo spread, as the Italians say, the difference between the uh, interest rates you have to pay in Italy and uh, you have to pay in Germany for the, uh, uh, the state, uh, state bonds. 
when this law spread, the difference became very large. Salvini shut up and became much more euro friendly because uh, he realized that uh, the, the markets don't uh, accept too much Euroscepticism from an Italian government. So, and there finally, there are popular constraints. In a, in a democracy, the final arbiter is the people and the people can throw these rascals out and they often do. I mean, the, the, the United States and Trump is an example. It was, uh, it was close, it was tight, but he was thrown out. And there are other examples where people throw out populist leaders uh, without further ado. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish uh, I wish those things would come to Hungary at this point. <laughs> it's overdue, <laughs> but uh... yeah, but I, I mean, the, the, I I see that. But there are there is an opposition, and in in Budapest they succeeded. The, the yes, opposition. They did. It's yes, so they it's did. not it's not a foregone conclusion that yeah. uh, a certain populist leader will be there for for eternity. The, 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 the fact that the opposition does not get its act together at the national level in Hungary contributes to the survival of the populist. Yes, definitely does. So, all right, so let's, uh, let's dissect where this paper comes from. So you wrote uh, <laughs> a very, very famous and very well cited and uh, I would say very important paper called The Populist Challenge in a, in a very, Beautiful special issue, uh, a tribute to Peter Mayer, I believe, uh, in in West European politics, and uh, and in you had an article there titled "The Populist Challenge," which uh, is obviously a, the the title is a reference to to that article. Um, in there, you I mean, you already brought up Peter Mayer's uh, idea of like a potentially partyless. Uh, democracy where the parties lose all their representative function and uh, and uh, and the populace can can just roll in through some kind of unmediated protest act um so can, like can we talk about this just a little bit you said that there's three types of protest parties there is the the um, um you know the new challenger in the party system there's the radical rejection party uh, radical rejection of the party system and uh, there is like an expansion of conflict beyond the party system so these are the three types um can we can we talk about this just briefly so just yeah but i mean the the first type was actually mm -hmm. the one that addressed peter mayer so yes but, I mean, we already talked about the functionalist and the structuralist interpretation of populism. Uh, I, I was part of this uh, special issue because I had known Peter Mayer and yes. I had been asked to contribute. And I thought populism was uh, one of the issues he had dealt with, but he had a very pessimistic point of view. He, mm -hmm. he, I mean, he was a party specialist. Uh, he was a party scholar. And in his view, uh, the future was partyless. So he, he, he not only lost his academic uh, uh, object, but he really deplored the way the party system developed. And, and my view, this structuralist view, was much more optimistic because. Uh, I did not see just the alignment and the party system going down the drain. I also saw, I saw the alignment and I thought he was right that the mainstream parties were running into problems. But I thought there was also a movement in the opposite direction. There was realignment. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, I have a Rockanian kind of view, which argues with a basic conflict in the social structure and, and uh, does not exclude that there could be new structuring cleavages like the four cleavages that have been uh, put into evidence by Lipset and Rocken. And, and I, I'm not the only one who has this idea, Hoge Mart or, or, I mean, there are many other people who have 
same idea that there is a new cleavage which has to do with uh, opening up of national societies and the re, re uh, closing national societies. The, we call it the integration demarcation cleavage, so Hoche Marx now call it the transnational cleavage, other people call it the cosmopolitan uh, communitarian cleavage. The idea is that there are new conflicts which have a lot to do with nationalism and with the preservation of the nation state or the creation of a multi multicultural uh, international society. And if you have this st more structuralist view, then you don't think the parties lose their function. You think it's just other parties which will, mm -hmm. which will have this function. And the way things are going, see the Greens are on the one side of this multiculturalism, nationalism conflict, and the radical right is on the other side. And you see both of them rising, have, I mean, it's, it's a decade long process or several decade long process, a process that started in Northwestern Europe in the 70s, early 80s, and which is going on uh, up to now. So this is the one uh, kind of populism I was talking about. And this is the one that is immediately addressing uh, the view of Peter Mayer. The other two, uh, this, this uh, anti-party populism, the, 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 the rejection of all parties uh, is, it would be the second uh, possibility, anti-politics of Rosan Vallon or, or if you take Cinque Stelle in Italy, they, they started out uh, with the idea of political renewal. Strangely enough, they did it in the form of a party. So uh, <laughs> although they were against all the parties, they still created the party. And, yes. and then there, there is the third version, which is really without parties. That's the movements outside of the party system, which uh, expand conflict. Uh, to in, in other forms, social movement organizations, the environmentalist movement, the, 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 the new climate uh, uh, movement, uh, they, they do mobilize outside of the party system, but in the final event, if they want to have uh, impact on politics, they are, I think, obliged to create parties as did the ecology movement of the 1970s and 80s, they created green parties or as did the radical right, the creative parties. And strangely mm -hmm. enough, even Beppe Grillo, he created a party, which is, as you <laughs> can see in Italy now, it's mainstreaming, it's part of the government and it's institutionalizing and it is behaving like uh, any other old party, more and more so. Yeah, so, so Peter Mayer would probably be happy to see this, right? <laughs> I, I'm not sure, I mean, uh, he would, uh, 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 I I was a visitor in 2008 at the EUI and we talked about it and he was not convinced, let's say. Maybe, mm -hmm. he, I mean, in the meantime, he might be more convinced, but at the time he, he didn't see it. Yeah. Uh, or he, for example, he said Blair, he wrote the paper on, on, on the, the third way kind of social <laughs> Democrats, Labour Party. Blair for him was a populist. But I, I think this is just not correct. I mean, uh, Blair was, if anything, an elitist. Uh, he, he, mm -hmm. he, he was not speaking the, the, the language of the bar. He was not, uh, uh, I, I don't think he, he, he was, uh, he was on the side of uh, those who opposed the people and the elite. He, he was much more, uh, a part of the elite and, and happy to be a part of the elite. And I don't think it is not helpful to, to consider everything as populism. There are people who think Macron is a populist. I don't mm -hmm. think so. Macron is like there, he's an elitist. These people are, if anything, technocrats, which is not the same thing as a populist, but they, they are definitely uh, part of the elite. I mean, I've seen the, the speech coding databases and uh, they very much agree with what you're saying over here. So, so I think Blair is one of the least populous people that's ever been coded. So, 
Yeah, but but Peter Mayer thought he was a populist, and and, and he, I mean, he he cited Marquard, Marquard, I think, uh, who who also thought. See, they thought they had this more personalistic leader kind of definition of populism. They thought Blair was a personalistic leader. He, he mm -hmm. more or less abandoned the party or, or he dominated the party to a certain extent. He didn't need the party anymore. He, he was directly in touch with the people. And I mean, in that sense, uh, in, in the sense of the, the strategy of the personalistic leader, the, there might be some truth in it. But I, we started out by saying that the ideational definition is, is the most important one. And, and I think it is helpful to distinguish exactly phenomena like Blair or, or, or on the one hand, Blair and Marco on the one hand and Salvini or Marine Le Pen on the other hand. It, it, it's mm -hmm. really a big difference, not only in the personalistic, maybe less in the personalistic uh, leadership style, but in the, in the thin centered illiberal ideology. Mm -hmm. So in this article, you also mention a little bit about Central and Eastern Europe, how things might work differently there, where the, you say the party system have not really produced a mainstream party that adequately represents the, the public. The party system is not very well institutionalized. And let's face it, there's some pretty poor administrative performance. Um, yes, I, I mean, the, the, it's interesting that the, the reviewer at the time mm -hmm. didn't want the Eastern European part in the paper. He said I should scrap that part. And I, I, want, I defended that part. I thought it was important and I wanted to include Eastern Europe. But what maybe was not clear enough, but what became clear to me later on is that in Eastern Europe, the, the crisis of representation is, is, a, is, a, is of a different kind. See, mm -hmm. we had, Peter Mayer had his functionalist crisis of uh, interpretation, the parties are no longer useful. And I had the structuralist interpretation, they are replaced by others. I think the crisis of uh, representation in Eastern Europe is a performance crisis. That, that I, see, I, I talked about corruption in this uh, in this yes. paper and, and poor quality of, of governance. And and uh, th there are papers uh, by by people from the Wiedem uh, Wiedem project, uh, Dahlberg and Holmberg and and Linde. They they wrote about this and they showed that uh, these what what these. Uh, party systems don't provide is output legitimacy. So mm -hmm. you could say in Western Europe, it's a problem of input legitimacy and Eastern Europe, it's a problem of output legitimacy. And, and Interesting. Uh, that you could say for a long time, people in Eastern Europe had a much higher pain tolerance than, than people in Western Europe, but up to a certain point and then People in Eastern Europe said no. I mean, and and they tried different parties, and all the new parties failed too because they were as corrupt as their predecessors. So I, I think indeed Eastern Europe has another problem than another represent crisis of representation than Western Europe. Uh, mm -hmm. That's why it's it's hard to to compare the two types of party systems. But in the final analysis, I don't know enough about Eastern Europe to be really on safe grounds. Yeah, I see. So, so, so where do you see this research agenda going or developing? Uh, what's, uh, what should young scholars uh, look for? Now, what I, themes? I mean, it's a big problem that, uh, Populism has become such an attractive and important topic. I, I personally, I think, as I already said, it's probably a temporary phenomenon. And, and mm -hmm. it's with the, I privilege 
the host ideology. And I privilege the structural uh, uh, roots of these populist parties. And I think populism as a strategy or as a thin-centered ideology or as a communication style is is a bit accessory it's a bit secondary and and the more important thing is actually the structural change and the realignment in the party system and it's okay these parties are populist whether we we have talked of populism from the right it's populism from the left Syriza, uh, is populism from the left in Greece or, or, or Podemos is populism from the left and, and in Eastern Europe you have populism from the center as uh, Peter Uchen uh, said. So I, I think all this is true but this is maybe not the most important story about party system change to tell. Yeah, I... I um... I make it a point to 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 separate the ideology. Like populism is there; it's important, not nearly as important as ideology. And all these people who write about the radical right, the populist radical right, very often I feel that if you just did a find and replace in the paper and took out populism and replaced it with nothing, it would be just a conceptually more cohesive paper. Uh, fortunately, less and less so. But uh, but there was definitely a lot of this five ten years ago. So. Uh, so yeah, so and and I've heard before that maybe we should start studying mainstream parties again because it would be interesting to figure out why how we could make them successful because the world is a better place when they are in power. Yeah, or, or uh, to find out why they decline. I mean, the, the, yeah. the social democrats are in full decline in many countries, and and how can you account for this? And yeah. what can they do to, to stop the decline? Can they do anything to stop the decline? Yeah. So, um, well, thank you very much, Hans-Peter Kreisi, for, for, for joining. Any concluding thoughts? No, it's nice talking to you. I think we, we made uh, the tour. We, we, we talked about many aspects, and, and I think... We talked about everything that's in the paper, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I have to tell you that I have recorded many such conversations, maybe about upwards of 30, one with you, actually, already. <laughs> and uh, and preparing for this was was one of the hardest ones because, uh, because the paper is so vast and so big and so all-encompassing. Uh, not in length, and that's that's the beauty of it. Is is you get a very very thorough review that I had a hard time pulling out. Like what what's the thread? What's the theme? What are the things to hit? So so well, I think we made it. I think I think it worked great. And thank you very much for that. So thank you for joining. You're welcome. Thanks. Bye bye, bye everyone. Bye.